Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Memory Through Stories. I'm so happy to be here with you all and with Nicola and Jordan. There. Hello. I want to begin by acknowledge. Can you hear? But you can't hear? Oh. <laughs> oh, joy. I should be standing up then because it's hard, it's easier to, th is that better? Okay. Um, I have a quiet voice, so I may drop off. If I do, you're just going to have to remind me. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know that. So I want to begin by acknowledging the fact that we are gathering on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Growing up as a Métis woman, I did not know the history of this country. I, my family, the, they tried to wipe out their own ancestry, so I didn't even know our history. Born in 1955 in Territory 1, I've lived in BC since 1986. For much of that time, I had no idea that it was my Métis great-great-great-grandfather, Jean-Baptiste Boucher, Wakan, that brought Simon Fraser here. Needless to say, I have felt some guilt over this and the knowledge that he went on to work in Fort St. James and as an enforcer for the HBC. We Métis have a very complicated history with Turtle Island. Some remain close to their First Nations brothers and sisters, and many of us were dispersed. Our ancestors went into hiding and became well assimilated. Claiming my Métis ancestry is an act of resistance and is one part of my own journey with decolonizing it is my hope that by acknowledging this, I have been, that I have been an uninvited guest, living, working on the unceded territory of many Coast Salish nations, will remind myself and others that we have benefited from what was taken from the original inhabitants and their living descendants of these lands. Is that loud enough? Good. So I need to begin by thanking our sponsors. Um, it's pretty wonderful that this event is free. I don't know about you, but there's many times in my life where um, free mattered. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to go if I didn't have access to free events. So it's very important, and I'm grateful to these people. So Word would like to also, there also Word says they would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors and donors. A special thank you to SFU and the Writers Studio for this wonderful space and their continued generous support of Word Vancouver. I'm a Writer's Studio graduate. <laughs> it's a wonderful program. The Canada Arts Council, the Canada Book Fund, the, Her the Canada Heritage Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, the BC Arts Council, BC Gaming, Creative BC, the City of Vancouver, DBVIA, the Yosef Wask Family Foundation, the Hamber Foundation, the BC and Yukon Book Prizes, and the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. There's a long list here. CWILL, Pace and Associates, the Crime Writers Association, the Federation of BC Writers, the Surrey Library, the Vancouver Public Library, the League of Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, the Vines Festival, and many more. For a full list of our partners, please visit our website. Without you, this free festival could not have happened. So if you haven't already, please consider donation, donating if you can via our website. And, or you can support the festival via online silent auction. Apparently there's a silent auction on wordvancouver.com. Is that me? Jordan, you gotta get that oil out there. Um, <laughs> Okay, and so one last businessy thing before we really launch into everything. Um, we have a bookseller here, Iron Dog Books. So feel free to pick up a copy of these two books that we'll be talking about today or any others. I highly recommend both of them. They are phenomenal books. They're both um, finalists for the BC Yukon Book Prize right now. So good luck to them. That's a pretty wonderful thing to be selected to be a finalist. 
So I'd like to start by introducing Jordan Abel first. Um, his book, we're talking today about Nishka. Incredible book. Jordan Abel is a Nishka, hope I'm saying that right, um, writer from Vancouver. He is the author of The Place of Scraps, winner of the Dorothy Livesay Poetry Prize. Uninhabited and Injun, winner of the Griffin Poetry Prize. These are big prizes. Abel's work has recently been anthologized in the new Concrete Visual Poetry in the 21st Century, The Next Wave, an anthology of 21st Century Canadian Poets, Poetry, Best Canadian Poetry, Counter Discretion, a glossary for writing within the Anthropocene, I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> um, and the land we are, artists and writers, unsettle the politics of reconciliation. Abel's work has been published in numerous journals and magazines, including Canadian Literature, the Capilano Review, and Poetry is Dead. And his visual poetry has been included in exhibitions at the Polygon Gallery, on Unit Pit Gallery, and the Oslo Pilot Project Room in Oslo, Norway. Abel recently completed a PhD at Simon Fraser and is currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta, where he is teaching Indigenous literatures and creative writing. That's why he's coming to us from Alberta, I believe. Hey, thank you. Am I am, is, oh. <laughs> am I supposed to go for it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're you're both going to read for about ten or okay. Um, so that I had sent that out earlier, but we're all getting so many emails right now, and that thread got so long that was kind of hard to figure out what we were doing. Yes, totally. <laughs> All good. Well, th th thank you so much for that for that intro. It is such a pleasure to pleasure to be here, and uh, you know, sad, sad I, I can't be there in person, but uh, but I'm here virtually. <laughs> so I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna read, uh, yeah, just a a short short excerpt. Well, two two short excerpts uh, from from Nishka. Uh, you know, just with the in intention of introducing the, the work to you for those who uh, who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, and the piece that I've been starting with uh, is, is actually the very first page of the book. Uh, it's called An Open Letter to All My Relations. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read the page <laughs> and I'll, I'll talk about it uh, really briefly. Um, it's taken me a long while to gather up the courage to share this book with you. This book has been difficult for me to write and for me to return to. This is a book with painful subject matter. This is a book about intergenerational trauma, indigenous dispossession, and the afterlife of residential schools. It is also a book that is about sexual and physical violence, lateral violence, depression, suicide, and self-harm. While I ultimately hope that this will be a book that helps people, I also want you to take care of yourself first. If now is not the time, there will be another time. Um, so when I, that was, was actually one of the last sections I wrote, wrote in this, of, of this book. Uh, and I, I, I wrote it because you know many of many of the first readers of this text asked me for some kind of content warning or or trigger warning, and and I, I really took those concerns uh, quite quite seriously, and I, I thought a lot about what it would look like to enact care for those people who encountered the book, uh, and whether or not. Uh, you know, and I, I really thought about, you know, wh whether or not, you know, this might be the, the, the right book for, for someone at, you know, at any given moment in their life. So I, I really, uh, yeah, I, 
really cha channeled that that thinking and that energy energy into that uh into that opening moment and there's there's also there's a closing moment in the book that's also called an open letter to all my relations and it's one that um that does some that does some different things <laughs> and i read that one far less frequently uh not not because of spoilers or anything but just because I, I find this to be a better way to, to introduce the subject matter of this work. Um, the, uh, the, the other section that I, I really want to read uh, just comes from, yeah, just comes from a, a moment fairly early on in this, in this book. Uh, and it's, uh, well, I mean, the section is called an excerpt of an audio recording at a presentation at the 2017 Trans Canada's Conference at the University of Toronto, um, which is a really, really long, long title for what this, what this thing is. But I'll, I'll, I'll just read a, a page or two from, from this one. Hi everyone, my name is Jordan Abel. I am a NISCA writer from Vancouver, BC. I identify this way because for many indigenous peoples, these kinds of national identifications can indicate one's home, one's friends and family, and one's position within indigeneity. Likewise, these kinds of national identifications can also, can often also be an indicator of which community or communities we are accountable to. That being said, these kinds of national identifications do not always adequately account for the complexity and plurality of indigenous identity. For some indigenous people, they sim simply do not tell the whole story. For example, when I say that I am Niska, you might assume that I grew up in Kinkolith, BC, like my grandparents. You might assume when I say that I am Niska, that I speak Niska. You might assume that my writing reflects on Niska knowledge, Niska worldviews, and Niska understandings. Then again, you might not assume any of those things. A few years ago, during the city of Vancouver's Year of Reconciliation event, I was at a dinner meeting at a restaurant on Water Street. I was one of a few poets that was commissioned to write a poem in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The initiative was called Reconciliation Through Poetry. The work that the poets were engaging with was meant to honor the work of Chief Robert Joseph. At the dinner meeting, the poets, along with a few administrators, talked with Chief Robert Joseph, exchanged stories, and discussed what reconciliation meant for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. After a while, Chief Joseph directed his attention to me and asked me where I was from. I told him that I was Niska and that my grandparents were from Kinkolith. After a few moments, he said, you're not really Niska. Some of my friends are Niska. Do you know how I can tell? If you were really Niska, you would have said Niska with a K sound, Niska. You said Nishka with an SH sound. You know, I didn't really know how to respond to that. My grandparents are Niska, my dad is Niska, but to a certain extent he was right. I wasn't born in Kinkolith, I was born in Vancouver, moved when I was very young, and essentially grew up in Ontario. Does that make me less Niska? And what does it mean anyway to be Niska with a K sound, and what does it mean to be Nishka with an SH sound? What does it mean to be Niska but to have grown up removed from the Niska community? What does it mean to be Indigenous if your relationship to community has become severed somehow? What does it mean to be both an intergenerational survivor of residential schools and an urban Indigenous person? I think these are the questions that I've been struggling with my whole life. And I will, I will, I will pause there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> I 
I can hear all the supplies. I don't know who's back there. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's a strange moment because I'm trying I'm paying attention to you and there's some people here, some lovely people here listening to you. Too bad we can't sort of face the camera that way once in a while. Um, so thank you so much. I'm glad you read that part because that was one of the parts that I really, really, really responded to as well. Um, not growing up with your culture, not even necessarily knowing who you come from. Not it, it can be interesting returning as they say <laughs> so next we will hear from nicola nicola i campbell is the author of forgive me if i mispronounce any of this she she etko shin chi canoe grandpa grandpa's girls and a day with ya 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 interior salish and Métis from British Columbia, her stories weave cultural and land-based teachings that focus on respect, endurance, healing, and reciprocity. Nicola's books have been among the finalists for numerous children's literary awards. Chin Chi's Canoe won the 2009 TD Canadian Children's Literature Award and was a 2008 Governor General's Award for illustration finalist. We're among some pretty accomplished writers here. Nicola is Interior Salish and Métis from the Nicola Valley, British Columbia. She is the author of five children's books, including, oh, it's repeating. Okay, we'll go through it anyway, because there's some new information here as well. <laughs> I've took it from the website, Nicola Valley. Shishi Etko and Jin Chi's Canoe, recipient of the 2009 TD Canadian Children's Literature Award, and most recently Stand Like Cedar in 2021. Her stories weave cultural and land-based teachings while also remembering sacred responsibilities and interconnectedness to the land. Her memoir, again, forgive me if I mispronounce this, Spill Exum, A Weaving of Recovery, Resilience, and Resurgence, is a deeply moving story basket of memories that is rooted within the British Columbia landscape with an almost tactile representation of being on the land and water. This book explores resilience, reconnection, and narrative memory through stories published by High Water Press. It's an astounding book. Nicola? Yeah, Quinto. Challenge quest. Nicola Campbell from the Nicola Valley. I'm in Skatmuch, uh, Thompson, and in Silk on my mother's side, Okanagan. And my dad was Metis from Saskatchewan. Um, yeah, so Spielachum, uh, the X is pronounced with like a clearing your throat sound. Um, it's not an X in that, like the English um, pronunciation. And um, I really appreciated your words, Jordan. Um, one of these days, maybe we can do a trade. Uh, I'm really curious, um, too, if, if you um, are strictly doing poetry in this book, pro prose, or I'm curious about it. I um, actually went through a lot just because of um, the fact that I don't stay with one specific um, genre uh, form and uh, kind of moving fluently between disciplines, which um, English literary publishers really struggle with. And um, I think as Indigenous writers, um, moving towards our own voice and honoring um, that fluid movement of, you know, returning to our true identity, um, our work um, moves further and further and further away from the confines of English literary writing, which becomes um, confusing for uh, non-Indigenous readers. Um, and I really hope, you know, that we keep moving towards honoring the voices of our elders and our ancestors and what comes more truth, you know, naturally in, in our own journey towards um, recovering from colonialism and genocide. But Spielachem um, <clears throat> is a collection of poems and stories um, starting dating back when I first started writing this over 25 years, um, possibly even 30. And so my first poem um, actually 
that I'm going to read is July 26, 1973. My apologies if you hear the dog next door. <laughs> I'm also canning salmon right now, so I have fish on the pressure canner. Um, and my daughter is in the room too. So <laughs> anyway, so what, what started, I just started writing and in the process, um, I'm, I, you guys disappeared, so that, okay. Um, my aunt gave me a collection of letters that my mother had written prior to my dad's passing and he passed away at Batosh during the Batosh Day celebrations. Um, and they met um, after she got out of residential school and she had traveled to stay with my, my aunt, her, sister, her older sister in Edmonton. So during that time, there was a lot happening with the Native youth movement and Indigenous rights and activism. And my dad was, um, you know, he was Métis and he's a spokesperson and activist. So that was how they met, I think, at the uh, Friendship Centre in Edmonton. <clears throat> July 26, 1973. They are on a hillside, baby on a blanket, nine months old. A thousand people, Saskatchewan River. This is Batosh. July 26, 1973. She calls when she sees two children bobbing like buoys, swift currents unyielding. John, those children are drowning. Daddy brought the children to shore, but he did not bring himself. The river would not set him free. Activist, revolutionary, woodland Cree, Scottish, French, Machif, fiddles, the Red River jig. Saskatchewan River flowed through his veins. Johnny Campbell was my daddy. He was Métis. So um, when I was trying to figure out the titles, I ended up moving it, things into different um, sections. So it started off with prairie letters. Then the next section is her blood is from Shpitich. So Shpitich is in my language. And that means, um, well, I translate it in the context of the poem. Swells of Sisletko. Cold, cold water, joining, transforming, reforming, rivers like sisters, singing clear and cold. Shinkiep sings through the valley, across the mountains, to the prairies. She's a Shuta, that one. Her blood is from the place where fresh water flows up from underground, sagebrush and fir boughs, juniper and wild roses weave through her veins. So that one is um, when when I got the poem, the letters about my dad, my dad. Um, I'm not finished. Sorry. Oh, no, no, <laughs> save your save your la um, clapping for after. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, after I received the letters, I was really kind of doing some soul searching. And that was when I actually wrote the one July 26, 1973. And basically what I tried to do was I tried to sit down and write verbatim things that have been said to me um, about the day my dad died. And then I did some like really thinking about why my mom would have moved home, why would she have left, and, you know, that concept of returning to our homelands and how important that was in her journey. So I have, like, different sections. Um, I was playing with words, and I wanted to um, – I just – this was one of my little projects. I did a poem in the shape of Huckleberry, a poem in the shape of a frog, and um, then I have um, – you know, some of the stuff on healing and learning to heal and trying to figure out what in the world happened. Um, I, you know, my Auntie Maria's book, Half Breed, was really in, influential in. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> Just uh, really understanding, you know, things that were, uh, that took place that probably um, shouldn't have. You know, we grew up with such violence and stuff that it was completely normalized. And so there is this whole process of really like awakening to what, you know, what wasn't right and where did it come from and where was it learned? And those are the questions that I was asking. So then the next uh, section, one of the sections is land teachings. 
Um, I don't have very much time. And so there's different, there's, okay, I wanted to read two more poems. Do I have time for two more poems? I think so. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> well, because of um, I'm in Plekatmoch and Silch, and we're, you know, from the Nicola Valley, um, we lost a lot of our language, especially my generation. Um, but, you know, what one of the things that we do that people, I think, don't really understand is, is the harvest is a tremendous part of our life. And so I, I have a couple poems. I didn't even realize when we put the you know, assembled it, that I had them facing each other. Uh, um, I have this one called Gathering, which is in the shape of a tree. And then I have another one called Gathering Songs. <clears throat> so this is Gathering Songs. Windows open wide, cruising mountain roads across our Shtwechmuch, Uyumch, the land, the land of the Shtwechmuch people. This little ford rides low, full with yayas, spielachum echoes of spring harvest and new shoots. Every springtime the land sings, beckoning our grandmothers to visit. Shtwechum blossoms unfold blessings on the awakening land. Springtime hungry on tiptoes we step across minuscule tattooing blossoms blooming on a bed of soil and pine blades of greenery grass tsuwada. oh something got there's a typo in this um tsuwada, nodding onions side by side like sisters arrow leaf balsam root and arnica blackened fingers sift and till grains of timuch Pluck sweet tattooing potato berries from the dust and return long pink worms to their cultivation. We seek you, our ancestor, little man, you are scooping, you are speaking, bitter red heart roots weaving gossamer threads. Tenderly we tug your arms and legs from the land while your pink blossom face sleeps tightly folded. We sing to you our stories. We sing to you our gathering songs. We sing you into our dear stew and ngach. Then sit patiently as you cook. This is our spring devotion ceremony, our honoring our ancestors, feeding our children the riches of our land to new. So then um, the next one, like there's um, actually a lot in here, but um, pressure canner rhythms because I'm canning salmon right now. And as an interior uh, Salish, as Salish people um, for, you know, the, the salmon um, sockeye and salmon, um, the five, you know, salmon that flow through the, the Fraser River and through the rivers of British Columbia, um, and even the kokanee, which is another landlocked salmon. Um, these are, um, you know, key to the way we live and the way we thrive on the land. And the salmon, um, as well as, you know, the, the four-legged, um, the deer, you know, the ones that walk, the ones that swim, the ones that fly, all of these um, all contribute, and the plants, and they all contribute, and they come together as new. And this is what I learned from one of my committee members for my doctoral program, um, Jeanette Armstrong, when she translated the word new, the, the land is not just just this, a thing that you know non-indigenous people say oh the land right um it the, the translation for timu is this intertwining of all living elements of the land that come together and the salmon and we as human beings as indigenous people are inter you know deeply intertwined with that um through our ancestral um you know um the fact that our grandmothers have been here and our grandfathers have been here for thousands and thousands of years. So pressure canner rhythms um, is a, about my godmother. Um, she's she's gone um, to the spirit world, but um, we were canning fish together. <clears throat> pressure canner rhythms. 
One eye blue as a midsummer Colchana sky, one eye brown as the trunk of a ponderosa pine, hair in ringlets or in a single braid. She's an Okanagan cowgirl, fish lake flows through her veins. She is my beacon, I am her tumbleweed, rolling, searching, learning. This harvest season, I bring my gathering, a cooler full of sockeye, clean, deboned, fillet, stuff, jar after jar, scales glitter across countertops and hands. Half pint mason jars line the counters, pink with sockeye, vinegar, and salt. Walker nearby, she wipes rims clean, watching the flick of my wrist, tightening lids, sanitized counters, cupboards, floors. There's comfort in shared presence. Steam, rock, rock, rocking, shake, shake, shaking, loading, unloading, reloading, pressure, counter rhythms in the night. Is that 12 minutes? I, we're not really keeping track that well. <laughs> that was wonderful. It was so nice to hear you read those poems. It's really wonderful. Um, I love reading, you know, just looking at a book and reading, but I really like hearing the poet read the work. Uh, it really adds another layer to it. Thank you so much. Um, so I've got a few questions for you two. First one for you, Nicola. Uh, but both of your books offer us insights into some of the inter effects of intergenerational. Pardon me, let me start that sentence again. Insights into some of the intergenerational effects of colonization and all that came with it. I'm starting to get cataracts. This is not fun, let me tell you. Um, the residential schools, the 60s scoop, the foster care system and the Indian Act, the many ways these things have caused pain and division in our communities. The way that these books are structured is so unique and very effective. And Nicola, you blend poetry and lyric prose. Your book begins with letters your mother wrote to her sister about you and your early life together. We also hear your story via the voice of young Nicola. In that section, I was particularly struck by all the sounds you offered us. The dresser drawers scraping closed, teaspoons singing ting, ting, ting. There was also the mention of smells like the raw hide hair tie. These, signs and, these sounds and smells, plus the details like the red rose tea and Pacific evaporated milk cans, the mini lipsticks that were once so popular, they all brought memories flooding back for me. Is this how memories come to you? Do they come to you with all the senses? I know as a trauma survivor, my memory is not good and it feels more like I'm watching a movie about someone else's life. Did the writing of this book bring forth more memories? Um, some of it was me like ting, ting, ting. Um, when I remember my elders um, storytelling and talking um, at the kitchen table when they would, um, I wrote poet uh, lullabies as kind of about that. Um, I specifically remember the way that they would describe events or even describe the teacup and that ting, ting, ting. That was something I remember my elders actually saying. Um, and they, they had all these different words that would, um, there's one I can't even, it's not, I know I know it, but I, the, the way they would describe sounds. And I think as language speakers um, and the way they enunciate things, um, that was a big part of it. So I would think of, you know, reflecting on the words that they said and the way that they would describe. And, you know, that was a specific memory when my stepdad um, left his hair tie. <laughs> There's a funny story, like he had really long, he has really long hair and he um, decided to go in a rodeo. And I remember his his hair tie on the counter and he, ha and he went on a uh, bareback I think at uh, one of the rodeos in the Nicola Valley I think in, actually in Kulshana and I was thinking oh no he's just using that buckskin hair tie and he just 
And so he went out there on, at, and the horse was bucking, right? And that hair tie came undone and he had really long Indian hair, like native hair. So it was thick and it was just blowing in the wind. So every time the horse would buck, the big wave of hair would just, anyways, that was, you know, there's just funny things like that. But I, I think it's more associated to the way my elders would tell stories, that the vi visual um, to connect um, time with moment, bring us right into the, the experience. I think that's where I learned that. And, you know, really, um, I'm going to say that reading um, the work of um, Neil McLeod in Indigenous Poetics, specifically Indigenous Poetics of Canada and the introduction um, with Lee Miracle and all the different writers coming together and the, the work of Leanne Simpson um, in really um, going deeper into our Indigenous voice in writing. Um, what they say to take out the, uh, oh my God, the Munyao uh, perspective and in, instead of, and I realized, you know, how hard I tried to adapt and how I feel like I could never measure up in that, you know, English literary community, right? And I realized how oppressive, uh, as Simon Ortiz writes about that, that experience has been for our elders and for us, you know, attending Indian day school or, you know, all these different experiences that we have as being raised by, you know, elders as a, who were raised, you know, to force to speak English, that 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 experience of always trying to measure up to the English literary voice is something that we're all trying to heal from. That's a big part of our trauma. And so that's something that I was really trying to step away from and trying not to hear that experience anymore and trying to key my my own self into the memories of things my elders said and the way they put words together as an English speaker. So sorry for taking so long. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. Well, you do it beautifully. Um, I love your writing. Um, and Jordan, in your book, there are times that you use images to create awareness around things like suicide and to help us feel your father's absence. You share court documents, written notes from your mother and your father's artwork and a few photos. Were these things that you always had access to or did they come to you via research and speaking with family members? Were there disagreements among your family members' re-family stories? I know there are in my family, <laughs> quite a few disagreements, mainly between the men and the women, interestingly enough. Um, did the writing of this book bring forth more of your own memories? Yeah, I, you know, just to just to pick up on that last part, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the the goal of the goal of the book, you know, is to try to try to figure out a way to talk about what intergenerational trauma feels like for me. And so, you know, there were certainly many points where, you know, I really was racking my brain to try and remember, you know, certain moments, certain exchanges, uh, and some, some of which I had really mostly forgotten, <laughs> you know, so I had to, I had to rely on these, you know, really kind of fragmentary memories. So there, like, if you, if you read the book closely, in particular, like in the, in the nonfiction passages, there's lots of moments where I, I point to remembering or not remembering certain details. Uh, and and those were were very um, functional <laughs> for me, uh, and I really wanted to to make it clear, you know how how much uh, how much of this or you know how lots lots of this work was was really uh, uh, a, an investigation in, into into memory, uh, and you know there there are certainly some things that I remembered better than others. Um, in, in terms of the in terms of the documents. Uh, you know, the, these, the, like these documents were things that have been hanging around, you know, my household, you know, <laughs> for my entire life. Uh, but it's, it's one of those strange things when you, when you start to think about, you know, how you might, as an artist, a writer, whatever, you know, 
reposition some of those documents within a book as as opposed to you know seeing them you know in a box in a closet or <laughs> you know in a photo album uh and so that was really challenging and there were and there were certainly you know lots of there's there's certainly lots of documents that um i thought of, i thought about including that i i didn't end up including and there was and you know and there are lots that uh, i of course included because they were you know necessary to the to the narrative in some way or another yeah thank you yeah that's always the challenge when we're writing what to leave in and what to take out can be very challenging what's moving the narrative forward i think you've done a wonderful wonderful job of it now I have one more question, but we're already at 3.13 and I did want to give the audience a chance to ask a question. So maybe I should let you ask a question and, and if you don't have one, I have one. Anyone got a question for them? I don't have a question, I'm just how much I appreciate it. I work in, in all of them. Thank you. I don't know if you guys could hear that. Could you hear that? Uh, it was just a thank you for the readings and in particular, uh, someone had been spent time in Nicolo Valley. So that really was very meaningful for them. So just an appreciation for the beauty and wonder of your work. Yeah. So I do have another question if no one else does. I've got to read from here because uh, that memory thing. So Jordan, you speak about the lingering presence of residential schools and that violence is learned behavior. And Nicola, you say love was the first thing taken away by the colonizers and the Indian residential schools and it was replaced and they replaced it with hurt and shame. I certainly saw these things in my own Métis family growing up. And you both speak to the fact that you did not have your biological fathers growing up for different reasons. Nicola, in one of your poems, now I'm gonna try not to cry. You say, I wonder how it would feel to stand in the presence of my father. I know I would feel safe. I know I would feel loved. I gazed into Musham's eyes and searched there for him. Now this poem hit me very hard because as young indigenous women, we are so vulnerable. And you, near the end of the book, you speak about the power of prayer. You, you, towards the end of the book, you start peaking, speaking more about the power of prayer and you talk about canoeing. Your father was Métis and the Métis in my family were prayer warriors. I've always prayed and it's how I've survived all these years. And we love our canoes. <laughs> Jean Talley says the voyagers could paddle one stroke per second. When I read that, I could feel it in my bones. Did writing this book, prayer and canoeing, make you feel closer to your father? Did it all make you feel stronger and protected in some way? And did these things help to heal and remove some of that hurt and shame? Um, I actually don't remember my dad. And so it's pretty, I just, I didn't want to forget the things that, you know, my aunts and uncles have said. And so by writing it down um, in poetry form and prose was an effort to just hold on to those memories for my kids. Um, and definitely like the last section, um, I think it's Resurgence, um, my publisher had asked me to, to write something in the here and now. And I um, was uncertain how to approach that. And as I didn't have any new like poetry, like um, I'm also working on my dissertation, but the, the, the here and now has so much of it has been about recovery. And, um, you know, one of the things I've been trying to do is in my healing is to, you know, and reflecting. I've been a lot of reflecting on, you know, the teachings as Anishinaabe about the seven prophecies and moving towards resurgence and what does it mean. And, and one of the things Leanne Simpson said is normalizing um, 
living in a state of where it's okay to be okay. Like, uh, I'm drawing a blank about the, the, the Anishinaabe word right now. I have it, I say it so many times and then, yet um, at this moment, but where, you know, we've lived in a state of survival where shame was what was normalized and being empowered was not and where um, that was our burden that we carried and um, that was why like in the one section I talk about untangling ourselves in order to reweave ourselves as an empowered people and you know all of all of those um, the, the the grief and loss that we've carried for so long and learning um, suicide um, as an option and really reflecting on where did that come from and why, why do we live in this way? And, you know, moving towards the, that concept and understanding that it's okay to be okay. It's really okay to be okay and to teach our children you know, instead of, because that was one of my fears was I lived in that state of depression and suicidal ideation due to unresolved grief for such a long, long time. Um, and especially because my mom is one of those people that refuses to heal as, as her oldest child and in how she conducts herself with me and my children. And so that untangling um, and learning to heal was a huge piece. It's is a huge piece every single day, every day, and allowing myself to to be okay, and not to carry, you know, in the sense where I'm I'm in it, where I'm in a depression or in the hurt, um, where I can step outside of it and, and put it away. Um, so that was about that, and and teaching, you know, teaching my children to be strong and to to live in, in their strength. And it's hard, right? Um, I had so many elders. I was so blessed by my godmother, my grandpa, you know, my auntie Delia, my schwoz, uh, to to help me on that journey. And now I feel really alone a lot of times. So that piece is really important and finding ways to embody it through my writing and, you know, my daily practice of living. <laughs> yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. No, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I wish we were in the room together. I really do. I almost went in and then I was like, I have like, you know, I was like, oh yeah, we're virtual. I was like, this is <laughs> I'm hanging on every word, trust me. And I'm sure everyone else in the room is, um, if I could see you. <laughs> uh, so Jordan, uh, you speak about meeting your father for the first time at 23 years of age, and I believe that you had wondered if he had been absent by choice. Forgive me if I've got that wrong. Um, you also speak about the cost of returning, which is something I very much relate to. Even though I had my father, he was a violent alcoholic and trying to hide the fact that he was indigenous. Colonization was so effective that my family tried to erase their own ancestors. For many years, I was lost and not sure of my place. You speak so well to this when you say the ground beneath our feet, the cost of erasure. That really hit me. The ground beneath our feet, the cost of erasure. So we're always on this shifting ground. You also speak to the problematic discourses of identity, complexity and plurality of indigenous identity. I want to wonder, ask if, did your blending of your father's artwork with your words, make you feel closer to him and to your nation. Did the writing this, of this book bring you some healing? I know reading it certainly brought me some comfort. Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, for, for, those of, for those of you who have who've seen the book, there's this, uh, there's this visual trajectory that that flows, that that flows kind of in in, in parallel, or uh, you know flows you know perhaps um, you know in in a different direction sometimes uh, than the than the narrative than the narrative threads of the book, um, and 
and in the in the visual in, in that visual thread, um, the the way it works is I'm always putting my my dad's artwork in conversation with with my textual work, <laughs> uh, and you know re recombine recombining them, and I and you know re readjusting them and, and finding ways that they either do or don't fit together. And, and in Nishka, I, I talk a lot about you know, or, you know, I asked the question, you know, what is it, what, what does it mean to have gotten to know my, my dad's art better than I've gotten to know my dad, you know, because that was the only, the only access I, I had to him at a, at a certain point. Uh, and I, and I, I think, you know, a, a subsequent question that I've been thinking about uh, is, you know, <laughs> How do you, how does indigenous knowledge get transmitted when uh, you've become severed from your community somehow? So how do, you know, I, I, how, like my dad's, you know, not here to teach me, you know, Niska painting, for example, you know, he's a painter and a, and a carver, you know, but can I still learn you know, can I still learn from the shapes and contours of his work that I have access to? And 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 that's a question that I, I'm really kind of thinking about and, you know, kind of struggling with. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure I've come to any definitive answer except that, you know, I'm still I'm still working with his work. <laughs> you know, and uh and that and that part of of, of Nishka, the visual part, you know, is is work that I'm continuing on and and moving forward, um, and you know, is 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 work that I'm working with. You know, right right at this very moment, um, you know, and it's and it's work that I'm thinking about differently, uh, m mostly because my my relationship to to fatherhood has changed pretty uh, substantially. Like my um, so, so Nishka came out before my daughter was born, and now my daughter's here. <laughs> she's she's two now, and you know I think, you know, my my thinking through of you know what what it means to be a parent, or you know what what it means to be someone someone's you know kid, I guess you know has uh has has really sh shifted quite dramatically, and you know and that. And, and and likewise, you know that that thinking through of what indigenous knowledge transmission actually looks like or is, you know, has also shifted, and and these are all all questions that I'm still wrestling with and and you know trying to trying to think through, and maybe just to circle circle back to a question that um, Nicola had asked, you know, really early on. Uh, you know that fluidity between between genres is is something that uh, has really you know become quite pronounced in my work recently. Like that, so that threads that visual thread in in Nishka, you know, is is a th you know a thread of visual and concrete poetry within a book of creative nonfiction, and the way that work is continued and carried forward probably. You know, will look much more like poetry than it does creative nonfiction. But those those elements, you know, blend together and and shift and um, you know move over over time, uh, which you know is always a thing that I think is is difficult for publishers to wrap their minds around. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? You have to pick one genre to put your book under, right? They need to change that, I think. Totally. <laughs> so annoying. And uh... it's a colonial ideology, right? It's a colonial ideology to conform to English ideologies, English literary expectations. Like as an indigenous writer, we have to fit inside their box. But yeah. no, I just don't think that that's okay anymore. And, you know, that's the whole, like, everything, like, with indigenous voices that's not where our elders speak from they don't speak from that perspective and in order for us to return to the voices of our own 
indigeneity or elders or languages. Our, yeah. our languages aren't English. We're not, we're not yeah. English. We're not, we don't originate as we're raised by speakers of indigenous languages and the, the, the voices are so fluid. And if we follow those rhythms. Yeah. A hundred percent agree with you. And thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry, but we're running out of time. 327. <laughs> I am not the best timekeeper. So really, thank you for giving me a heads up. Um, I get so engrossed in what's going on and I just would love to keep talking. And I really encourage you to pick up both of these books. Iron Dog Books is out there. Um, Jordan spoke a bit about the things he's done with his father's artwork in here, um, but there's other visual things as well that he's got in here that are phenomenal. And the way that Nic Nicola moves between prose and poetry, and it's, it's just wonderful storytelling. Um, so I really encourage you to pick up books. So thank you to all the staff and volunteers at Word Vancouver for making this possible. A big thank you to our tech team from Stay at Home. <laughs> Stay at Home Fund fundraising to, for helping to bring this event to you. There are plenty more events happening. I don't know how many more. Are we at the end, towards the end of the? Yeah, so there's some events. <laughs> this is a script, everyone got the same script. There are plenty more events, no, some events happening. Please check out the complete listing on the word.ca. So thank you so much for coming to us virtually. It was wonderful to meet you, Nicola, and uh, wonderful to see you again, Jordan. And thank you to the audience. Thank you. Take it easy, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you all.